أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على محمد الأمين وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين يا رب العالمين Dear respected viewers, those of you joining us from all over the world I welcome you back to this live show from the holy and blessed city of Karbala and this is your show Back to the Basics where we will be discussing the basics and going back to them of theological and jurisprudential as well as ethical disputes between ourselves and others or differences for those who want to use that word as opposed to disputes not necessarily every conflict will result in a dispute or a heated discussion but rather we do naturally differ with those who don't share the same beliefs as us this is something very normal and this is the show inshallah ta'ala which aims to bring a more systematic methodology to that discussion today is of course the night of thursday or the as we would say in arabic to be a bit more confusing for those that don't know the language the night of friday because it's thursday night and obviously the day has ended, so it's become night time, and we would call this the night of Friday, Laylatul Juma. So when we say this, we see that there is a real emphasis placed in our narrations for the Shia to visit the holy city of Karbala. And that's why on a night like this, the city of Karbala will be quite packed and quite busy with numerous zuar, primarily coming from other cities and provinces within the nation of Iraq. But one thing that I thought was quite interesting to tie into this, of course, is we have several narrations in one of our books called Kamala Ziyarat, um, which mention the Kamala Ziyarat, of course, being an excellent and very important work by one of our great theologians, Ibn Kulawayh. And in this work, these narrations place a heavy emphasis upon visiting the city of Karbala on a night like this. They go as far as to state that Allah Azza wa Jal, I'm being very clear now, I want you to listen to the full context, that Allah Azza wa Jal does the visitation on a night like this, and as do the close angels, and some narrations state that the prophets do as well. But how have our ulama understood such narrations? All of our ulama without failure, who have commented upon this narration, have always stated that no, this cannot be understood literally. However, we have those of other schools who wish to distort and wish to attempt to divide the Shia in regards to their beliefs by casting aspersion and doubt upon this narration. It's quite a pathetic tactic because firstly, this narration is, is narrated and normally utilized in the area that we would call Targhib and Tarheeb. It mentions the merits of a certain action. It's not being compiled into works of theology. It's not being used as a narration pertaining to the sifat and attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. So we ask the question, those individuals who make videos about this particular narration, what is their intention? Their intention is to show that we Shias have a silly understanding of Allah Azza wa Jal and that we literally believe he comes and visits Imam al Hussein and that this is an act of kufr. Of course, what must be noted here is that what's particularly problematic is those who engage in the action known as projection. Projection, of, is of course, is where you have a certain negative trait and you see other people who might have something similar to that negative trait and you begin to hate that trait that you see in other people. They might not even have that trait, but you, you see it in them and you project that trait onto them because really you're disgusted by that very trait within yourselves. And I really feel that with all due respect, um, inshallah ta'ala, I'm trying my best not to offend anyone. But with all due respect to those who come forward with this point, we really are looking at a case of projection. And the reason I say this is because if you look at their theological framework, the way that they interpret the attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal, their particular worldview, you would see that this is their way of engaging with the traditions and not the way of the Shia. The Shia have a principle that with such a narration like this, that because it's Khabar al-Ahad, and because it's not even Sahih, that such a narration, even if it were Sahih, would not form a theological basis, because it goes against the intellect, number one. 
And number two, it goes against the plethora of sound, authentic traditions which state that Allah Azzawajal does not have a body and does not move. So when we know that, we know that we have a sound framework by which we interpret such narrations. And it's a perfect example of the thing I was discussing in the previous few episodes. A conceptual framework for the interpretation of religious texts and doctrines. But those protagonists who attacked the Shia for this particular narration, is there any reason why there would be a particular I don't want to use the word sickness, but deficiency that caused them to believe that Shias would view things in such a way. I believe that there is, and allow me to reaffirm that the Salafi or Athari doctrine on the Asma and Sifat of Allah Azzawajal is to affirm them and what's found in venerations without dwelling into the nature of modality or the how of something. So they'll affirm an attribute spoken of in the narrations and they will not discuss how. We've seen already that Salafis believe that Allah Azawajal has a form and we'll come to that more later inshallah ta'ala but for now I wanted to quote something from Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen in his Fatawa al aqidah volume 1 page 85. Su'ila Fadilat al-Sheikh هل نثبت صفات الملل لله يزوجل. The Honorable Sheikh was asked, is boredom, tiredness, or weariness an attribute which is established for Allah Azawajal? فأجاب بقوله. So he responded with his saying, جاء في الحديث أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله عليه وآله قوله فإن الله so there are from amongst the scholars those who say that this certainly proves boredom, tiredness or weariness as an attribute for Allah. لكن ملل الله ليس كملل المخلوق. However, this action of tiredness, boredom, or weariness is not like the tiredness, boredom, boredom or weariness of the creation. Even إن الملل المخلوق ناقص لأنه يدل على سامه وفجره من هذا الشيء. And the tiredness or weariness of the creatures is imperfect. And he goes on to say, whereas the tiredness, weariness, or boredom of Allah Azawajal is perfect. He states that whilst this is an established doctrine, because the ulama who affirm this believe in it based upon veneration. But then he goes on to state, just to be fair, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَالْ إِنَّ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ لَا يَدِلْ عَلَى السِّفَاتِ الْمِلَلِ لِلَّهِ إِطْلَاقًا لِأَنْ قَوْلَ الْقَائِلِ لَا أَقُومْ حَتَّى تُقُومْ لَا يَسْتَلْزِمْ قِيَامَ الثَّانِي وَهَذَا أَيْضًا لَا يَمْلُ حَتَّى تَمَلُّ لَا يَسْتَلْزِمْ ثُبُوتَ الْمِلَلِ لِلَّهِ أَزْوَجَلْ وَأَلْ لِكُلُّ حَالْ يجب علينا أن نأتقد إن الله منزح من كل عن كل الصفة الناقص من الملل وغيره فإذا ثبت إن هذا الحديث دليل على ملل فالمراد به ملل ليس كملل المخلوق. So he states and there's also those who state that this narration does not necessitate that the law gets bored, wearied, and tired because it's a perfectly fine function of the Arabic language. To affirm something or to, to state something without affirming the secondary part. So I could state, I will not stand until you stand. But when a person stands, I might not necessarily stand. So he states that some scholars have said that Milal isn't necessarily something which Allah Azawajal attributes to himself. And he gives a final conclusion. He states that whatever the case, Al Milal if it is attributed to Allah, is not an attribution of deficiency. 
because Allah Azza wa Jalla is perfect. But the question here is, these scholars, in their literalism, why would they take an attribute such as boredom, weariness, or tiredness and attribute such an attribute to Allah Azza wa Jalla? Why couldn't they use their minds and say that, look, we're going to adopt the second position listed by Uthaymeen. Is it because in reality their minds don't play that much of a role and the intellect isn't truly trusted? Let's take another few more examples of where this thinking can really get one into a mess. One of the narrations found in the Sahih of Bukhari. I'll, st I'll state the translation and I'll cite the translation from an official translation. Narrated from Abu Hurairah that the Prophet والسلام, said, Allah created the creation and upon finishing the rahim, the womb, it got up and took hold of the loins of Ar-Rahman. It took hold of the loins of Ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahman, of course, being a name of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah said to it, what is wrong? The womb said, I seek refuge with you from Al-Qati'ah, the one who severs the ties of the family. Allah said, would you be pleased if I bestow my favors on him who keeps your ties and withhold my favors from he who severs your ties? The womb responded, certainly, O Lord, Allah said, that is granted. So Abu Huraira comments, if you can recite, if you want, you can recite the verse, would you then, if given authority, do mischief in the land and cut the ties of kinship, arhamakum. That's Surah 47, verse 22. So we notice here that it says that the womb grabbed hold of the loins of Allah Azza How do the scholars comment on this? It's mentioned in Fath al-Bari of Ibn Hajar al-Askalani wa fi rawayat Ibn al-Sakkan fa'akhavat bil-haq wir-Rahman wa fi rawayat al-Tabari bi-haq wir-Rahman bi-tathniyah and in the reports of Ibn Sakin are the words, and seized the loins of Ar Rahman. And in the reports of a Tabari, and seized the Haqwi of Ar Rahman. So we see that these commentators have specifically stated it's referring to the loins of Allah. Join us after the break in which we continue analyzing this particular narration, inshallah. Ta Dear viewers, thank you for joining us after that short break. We see that the Salafi position when restated is we must affirm whatever Allah and His Messenger salam, affirmed for him. We must take the attributes upon the literal without describing the howness. So embracing this principle, we must affirm that Allah has loins or haqqan. Some of you are thinking that this has never been done before and we don't normally see the scholars affirming loins for Allah Azza wa Jal. But we find that one of the classical scholars of the Salafi school, whose name is Ibn Hamid, states the following, يَجِبَ tasdiq bi an Allah bi an lillah haqwa fattakhav ar-raham bi haqwihi it is obligatory to believe that, I'm sorry, I'm just going to request the brothers in the studio to turn off my echo. Thank you. It is obligatory to believe or affirm that Allah does have a loin and that the womb actually attaches itself to it. So this is a statement of a classical scholar. We must believe that Allah has a loin. Brothers and sisters, what is this affirmation of this loin for Allah? What does it mean to have a loin? And I know we're going to be told that this is a loin which befits the majesty of Allah Azza wa Jal. But seriously, is this the intellectually respectful Tawheed? The Tawheed that respects the intellect of a human being. Tell us what it means. Enough. We've been told that Allah Azza wa Jal has a shadow and a shade 
and we affirm these things. We've been told that some scholars affirm that Allah gets tired, bored, and weary, and yet we're told that these are all things that befit His Majesty. This is a disaster for human interpretation of the Quran. And if we want to take this literal stance, let's apply it literally on everything. We come to the nature of Allah Azawajal and the shape of Allah Azawajal. Let's see what this school believes about the shape of Allah Azawajal, this form which is like Casper of a friendly ghost but better according to some of their online apologists. Abu Huraira reported that Allah's Messenger said, Allah the Exalted and Glorious created Adam in his own image with his length of 60 cubits. And as he created him, he told them to greet that group. And that was a party of angels sitting there and listened to the response that they gave him. For it would form his greetings and that of his offspring. He then went away and said, peace be upon you. The angels said, may there be peace be upon you and the mercy of Allah. And they made the ad an addition of the mercy of Allah. So he would get into paradise so he who would get into paradise would get in the form of Adam, his length being 60 cubits, and the people who followed him continued to diminish in size up to this day. So Allah, according to this narration, which clearly states that Adam has been created upon his image, is 60 cubits tall as well. Do we see human beings who are 60 cubits tall today? This is not just any narration. This is a narration found in Sahih Muslim. This particular narration is found in Sahih Muslim. A very authentic narration which is considered to be a narration taken for Aqidah. So we're told, respect the intellect, come to Islam, but when you get into Islam, turn off the intellect. Why? Because which intellect is going to believe that Allah Azza wa Jal is 60 cubits long? Or that we have ancestors which were 60 cubits long? For anyone out there who wants to listen to this, I want you to look up how big 60 cubits long is and ask yourself, do we have the possibility of human beings walking the surface of this earth as being 60 cubits long? This methodology which doesn't respect the intellect is one that must be abolished, one that must be cast to the side further than that, if we want to take this literalist method of how to believe in what we read about on the surface value, then why is it that Salafis have objections to us saying that Allah Azza allows us to call ourselves servants of anything other than Him? Let's take an ayah of the Quran, and this ayah is Surah 39, ayah 53, where it states, Say, O my servants, who have acted extravagantly against their own souls, do not despair of the mercy of Allah. Surely Allah forgives the faults altogether. Surely He is forgiving the merciful. This particular verse states clearly, Say, and it's addressing the Holy Prophet, O oh, my servants. So when the Prophet says, say, when the Prophet says, O oh, my servants, is he narrating the words of Allah Azza wa Or is Allah commanding him to address people as literally his servants? If we want to take this literalist methodology, we know fine well how it's going to go. For those of you who want to see how respectful to the intellect this methodology really is, let's go one step further. Have you ever asked the Salafi why they affirm that Allah Azza has two eyes? Why they affirm that Allah Azza has specifically two eyes? If you want, go back on that forum that I mentioned a few nights ago that I cited my friend Basam Zawadi from. Multaqa Ahlul Hadith. See the forum and the thread where he asks what is the proof that Allah Azza has two eyes? They will all quote for you the following narration, Abdullah bin Amr narrates in Sahih al-Bukhari, Once Allah's apostles stood amongst the people, glorified and praised Allah as he deserved, and then mentioned for Dajjal, saying, 
I warn you against him, i.e. the Dajjal, that there was no prophet but warned his nation against him. No doubt Noah warned his nation against him. But I tell you about him something of which no prophet told his nation before me. You should know that he is one-eyed and Allah is not one-eyed. So this particular narration is utilized by them. Another narration which is utilized by them is also in Sahih al-Bukhari. Abdullah narrates that the Prophet mentioned al-Masih al-Dajjal, the Dajjal, in front of the people saying Allah is not one-eyed while the Messiah al-Dajjal or the false Messiah is blind in the right eye. So they've taken this narration, this narration that anyone else would take and say that look, Allah Azzawajal is not for Dajjal, they've taken it and stated that no, the Dajjal is described as being blind in one eye, having a deformed eye, and Allah is not one-eyed, therefore Allah has two eyes. Where in the Quran does it say that Allah has two eyes? Is this a good enough basis for affirming two literal eyes for Allah Azzawajal? Furthermore, let's look at the consequences of using this to affirm that doctrine. Are you telling me that if it were not for this narration that states that the Dajjal has one eye and Allah is not one eyed, that we would have perhaps been confused that the Dajjal is Allah Azzawajal? When these people come to us and they say that you, the Shia, raise the status of the Imams to the status of Godhead. We have to wonder what kind of deficient and pathetic God are we talking about? What kind of limited God are we talking about that by me attributing the ability to do extra miracles and extra abilities which are God given to a man, it puts him on par with God? The clear answer to this is if you believe Allah Azawajal is like the Dajjal, but the main difference between the two for you to distinguish is that the Dajjal only has one eye, whereas Allah has two, then clearly we can see why you believe that the Imams we believe in are better than that God. Because our Imams have far more abilities than just this Dajjal. Our Imams are clearly distinct from this Antichrist, whereas Allah Azawajal Apparently, the only distinction between him and the Antichrist here is that Allah Azawajal does not have one eye. Brothers and sisters, when it comes to the nature of not trusting the intellect, let's look at the real problem here. One of the real problems here is that when we discuss with atheists, we come forward with certain theological proofs, certain theological evidences which we use to try and convince the atheist of the existence of God. One of them would be, for example, why anything that appears in front of me, be it these books or these tables or even myself, must have, we know it's not always been there. And one of the proofs for that is it has certain limitations. And we ask ourselves, what gave it the limitations? And we say that because it has limitations, we know it's not eternal and it's not divine. Yet these people place limitations on Allah and do takfir of those who don't believe that Allah has limitations. They say that it's a deviant position to not affirm a form for Allah Azawajal. What is a form? It means a distinction. What is that distinct nature? It means a, a nature that has certain limitations and differs it from something else. They believe that Allah Azawajal has limitations. This methodology is one that does not respect the intellect. And all we're asking for in the discussion of worldviews is that we respect the human intellect. Dear viewers, thank you once more for joining me. I pray that you can join us in the next episode after one day, inshallah ta'ala. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.